Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 171. A little progress each day adds up to big results. Mongo Wilder. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Film Convert. Film Convert, I used heavily on creating the cinematic look I got on my film, This Is Meg. It helps you give your digital video footage a beautiful cinematic look of film instantly. Whether you're shooting on a GoPro, a DSLR, a RED, an Alexa, a Black Magic, it doesn't matter. Film Convert has created specific camera profiles for every, almost every camera on the planet so it can adjust to your footage. Film Convert gives you the power to create amazing looking cinematic images with just a couple clicks. And of course, because you guys are part of the Indie Film Hustle tribe, you get 10% off Film Convert by using the coupon code HUSTLE. But you can try this software for free, guys. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Film Convert. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Film, C-O-N-V-E-R-T. This show is also sponsored by the iTunes release of This Is Meg the movie that you guys have been listening about for the past year. Uh, and it's finally going to be available on iTunes on August 4th. Just head over to thisismeg.com forward slash iTunes. And if you pre-order it, you get a nice discount before August 4th and be the first one to get it as soon as it gets released. Today, guys, I want to talk about uh, a question I get asked about all the time. And also, I've been recently getting a lot of emails Uh, and messages about this specific topic is how to create revenue streams for your film. Now, I did another episode about specific places where you can go and make different revenue streams for your movie in episode 44. It's going back a bit. But today's episode, I wanted to talk about more of the entrepreneurial side of filmmaking and what other filmmakers have done and what empires have been built by following the principles I'm going to lay out in this podcast. So if you're a filmmaker out there who wants to actually turn your filmmaking passion into a business, a real business, then take a listen. So I've said this before many, many times on the podcast and on the blog constantly is you have to not only create an audience, but better than creating an audience for yourself, find an existing audience that's already there. I've said this before, but I'm going to go over it as a refresher for everybody who has not heard this before. Finding an audience of a specific topic uh, that you're going to try to make a movie about, whether that be a documentary or whether that be a narrative, is imperative. So a quick case study is This Is Meg. This Is Meg has been made specifically for you guys, for filmmakers who want to know the process of how to make films. But it also has a few other audiences that we are marketing to, like struggling actors, which is uh, a lot, (laughs) who wants to see a funny, true story of what it takes, and also show them how we made the movie, what we could do, uh, you know, with very little money and just a bunch of actors getting together and making a movie. Another audience that we never thought about was ayahuasca. We have an ayahuasca scene in the movie. If you guys don't know what ayahuasca is, I'll leave a definition in the show notes. It's complicated, but very funny in the movie. So these are a couple of uh, other areas that we didn't really focus on with Meg, but now after the movie was made, we started marketing to it and it's been very successful. So finding that existing audience and marketing to them is key. Now, once you find this audience, you can make films for them. You can make content for them. You can make products for them because they are very receptive. They want what, they want what you've got. Smart filmmakers do this, whether that be narrative, and I'll give you a narrative example. Let's say we're going to go make a horror movie. My God, are there plenty of horror movies out there. But why don't you like go to a niche of a niche of a horror movie? Let's look at like a movie like Hatchet. Hatchet was an American-based, old-school slasher movie, which is a subgenre of the horror movie. And they went really bloody, really heavy, and they marketed to horror lovers, people who loved horror movies. But I think one of the places that they fell short on or did not, not fall short on, but they did not take full advantage of is their market. 
what they could have been marketing to is also independent filmmakers who make horror movies. How about showing how they did it, actually showing courses and creating courses, which I'm going to talk about later, about how they made the movie, how you do blood work, how do you do makeup work, and market that with piggybacking on the success of a big horror movie like Hatchet. But again, you have to think about it more organically, more entrepreneurially, as opposed to just a standard, I'm going to make my movie and sell it. Another thing that you have to understand in creating extra revenue streams is you have to understand social media. In social media, you will be able to find those audiences. You will be able to go to those Facebook groups or those Twitter followers or those Instagram trendsetters that you can tap into. Same goes for YouTube, I mean, which is the second largest search engine in the world. I mean, what kind of research can you do just by typing in YouTube and, and finding out what's out there for your specific genre or what you're trying to do? Again, understanding your market, understanding your audience is so imperative when you're a low-budget filmmaker. Once you understand that, and so you have to get these two things really clear, and I know I'm glossing over like finding the audience, creating an audience. I've actually been asked to create a course specifically about how to create revenue streams and doing a real detailed course about it, which is something I'm thinking about. And if you guys think it's a good idea, please email me at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com and let me know your thoughts. Now, I'm going to give you some case studies that a couple you might have heard before, but a bunch that you've never heard before. And I'm going to tell you what these guys are doing, both in the narrative space, in the YouTube space, and also in the doc space. Not just food docs, but also other docs as well. So first up, one of my favorite movies, (laughs) favorite short films of all time, Kung Fury. This is an amazing story of a crowdfunded film from Europe. I I forget where he's from. I think he's in the Netherlands somewhere. And they made this 80s romping kind of uh, homage to just cheesy, wonderful 80s movies. And they threw literally everything in the kitchen sink in this storyline. It's about 30 minutes long. That little short film has spawned its own industry which is remarkable for a short film, not a narrative feature or a doc feature, but a short film. They really understand their audience and they knew how to market to the audience they were going after. They even got David Hasselhoff, the Hoff himself, to do a music video and and score a song specifically for the short. Now, they did have the money to pay him because they crowdfunded it, but then again, they knew their audience and that's where they got the money to do this. So what other revenue streams are Kung Fury created? Well, they created LPs. uh, They created VHS, limited edition copies of it. Obviously, they sold Blu-rays and DVDs. Uh, They streamed it everywhere. Uh, They actually posted, they actually got it sold to El Rey Network, which I saw on. Uh, It's on Netflix, for God's sakes. It's a short film. It was on Netflix. Uh, And the reason why Netflix picked it up, by the way, is because Netflix wants audiences. So if you've got a property that has a big audience, they'll buy it because they want your audience to come over, click, and subscribe on Netflix. That's when they pay the big money, when they feel that there's a big audience that can they can actually monetize. Gabriel Iglesias, a good buddy of mine, Fluffy, has done just that. He has a huge audience on YouTube and on social media, and he has tons of specials. And if you go on Netflix right now, you'll see a ton of Gabriel Iglesias specials and new specials coming out. Why did they pay him? I don't know how much they paid him, but they paid him a good amount of money for these. Why did they do it? Because he has an audience that they brought into Netflix. But that was a side note. So Kung Fury. Uh, they also have leather jackets with all of the you know different characters from the movie. They they have so many different swag items that is insane, and they made more money. I guarantee you, off of all the swag than they ever did off of selling the movie. The movie became a marketing tool for the merchandise that they were selling, and that is where you hope to be. The Star Wars model. They make a lot of money on Star Wars, but they make more money on t-shirts. Let me tell you the story of, real quick, on a side note, do you know why Marvel and Sony finally got together and let Spider-Man join the Marvel Universe? I'm going to tell you really frankly and straight up, this is a story I heard. What I heard was that off that Spider-Man Homecoming movie that just got released a little while ago, Marvel gets not one dime of it. Not one dime. 
all they had was creative control and incorporating their own characters in it. So they basically ran the show, Sony wrote the check, and Sony gets all the money. But Spider-Man has, now Marvel has the right to put Spider-Man in, I think, six movies of theirs. And they paid Sony another $175 million for all the merchandising rights. And because Disney has a massive merchandising just arm that can just pump out product left and right, it was the sweetest deal for both Sony and Marvel. They understand that the movie is just a marketing ploy to sell t-shirts, hats, lunchboxes, and so on. That's where you want to get on a smaller level, obviously, than Disney with your independent film. Now, another amazing case study is Turbo Kid. Turbo Kid kind of taps in a little bit to that Kung Fury crowd, which is that 80s nostalgia, where now they created such an endearing uh, endearing movie that was really very, very graphic, very raw, very 80s style, and they did the same thing, sold T-shirts, streamed it everywhere, had public screenings, and they're still making money. Shaked, who was the producer of Turbo Kid, was on the show a while ago, and he's you know, licensed out Turbo Kid to different um, manufacturers to start selling T-shirts and different clothing lines. And he gets a cut of all of it and never, never even has to pay to make it. It's remarkable. So he's making money hand over fist off of a little independent movie. So another, uh, another amazing story, and I, I, just did an inter- I just did a podcast about this, was Range 15. And to review Range 15 real quick, they had they crowdfunded one point two million dollars, one point three million dollars, something like that. Made their movie, sold it directly to their audience, which was all military, police, uh, firemen, that kind of uh, community. And they sold T-shirts and hats and posters and product, and they've made a ton of cash because they understood their audience, made a product for their audience, and sold it to their audience. Their audience is happy. They're happy and they move on to the next project. Now, let's go over to YouTube. Um, I found an amazing uh, story, uh, a guy named Christopher Sharp, who uh, invited me onto his podcast, and I'm hoping going to have him on our podcast soon because I want to talk to him a little bit about how he did what he did. He's the uh, co- co-founder of Yoga with Adrian. So he basically took a, a friend of his who's an actress. They got together, teamed up, and started making YouTube videos. In the first year, they made no money, barely any money, but they kept pounding it. And slowly but surely, because of the amount of content they were creating on YouTube, they started to rank and rank and rank. And right now, they have over 2.5 million followers on YouTube. And as you can imagine, yoga is a fairly competitive niche on YouTube and <laughs> just type in yoga and yoga with Adrian will come up first uh, or close to the top but there's a lot of yoga videos out there so it, it, it was amazing how they were able to crack the top uh, 10 and just really own that space and own that niche on YouTube so what did they do they started creating courses they actually created an online streaming service of all her videos and exclusive videos for a monthly fee they created a clothing line that they could sell directly to, to people. They actually went after a market. It was a niche of a niche. They went after a niche of people who did not feel comfortable going to a yoga class because of body images or whatever, and then they went after that so they could start their home, home practice to the point where a lot of people who weren't comfortable became comfortable and went to do yogas in classes, and a lot of them trained to become their own yoga teachers. And they started teaching training and and all sorts of stuff. It's remarkable how much money these guys have been able to make. This is his full-time job. So that's a great way because you don't have to just make movies and feature films to to start a business online or being a filmmaker. This is another way. They make 30 minutes. Chris makes 30 minute or or hour-long videos. This is a production company now. And they're doing this on their own, they have no bosses, they do whatever they want, whenever they want, and they make money doing it. Is that the dream or not? If you enjoy doing what you're doing as an artist and as a businessman, then why not do it? Another amazing story, and this is a legendary story, is Rocket Jump. Rocket Jump, obviously, was on the show, Des, uh, one of the co-founders on the show, and they those guys created this empire of, I think, now almost 7 million or over 7 million, 8 million subscribers on YouTube and they leveraged that subscriber base to create a production company and now they're making 
huge uh, shows on Hulu and uh, doing feature deals and all sorts of stuff that they're doing. And they it took them years to do, but they were able to do it. And now off of that, every time they did a, an episode or a season of Video Game High School, which was their first series, they did three seasons of that. They sold so much merch, so much T-shirts, so many hats, Blu-rays, DVDs, uh, all sorts of different swag to their audience, their rabid audience base, because they loved what they were doing and they knew what they were doing when they created Video Game High School and they knew what they were going to do and sell afterwards. But they probably made more money selling merch than they did off of advertising revenue they got on Google for for all the views that they got. Now, those were some examples of feature films that have done an insane job of creating businesses and creating multiple revenue streams for their features. Now, I'm going to go into the docs. Now, these guys are killing it. The guys I'm about to talk about are just inspiration on top of inspiration. The one I always use is Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. It's an amazing documentary about how uh, an overweight man, uh, very overweight, changed his life by juicing for 60 days, lost weight, got healthy, and basically started a revolution. The whole juicing craze kind of was launched off of this documentary because it was so potent in the message it was going for. So Joe Cross, who is the, uh, di- the, the director, the subject of that documentary, and also a businessman prior to being that. He was not a filmmaker. He just started to make a film because he just wanted to make a film. But when he saw the reaction as a businessman, he's like, oh, wait a minute. I can, I can make a business out of this. I could do this. So what he did is he, he created a site called Reboot, Reboot with Joe, which is like rebooting your, your body and everything. And then RebootWithJoe.com, Joe sells books, recipe books, uh, actually product lines for uh, plant-based proteins. He has a guided reboot where a nutritionist will come in and work with you for 15 days or 30 days, and you can buy that so they can kind of guide you through a juicing cleanse. He also has coaching services, certifications, apps. He actually sells apps on juicing recipes, so he transferred a lot of his books into apps. So he's making multiple revenue streams off of one little documentary. Now, that documentary originally was sold and sold and sold, but now he gives it away. You can watch it on the site for free. You can watch it on Amazon for free. You can watch it everywhere for free because he knows that 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 movie is now just a big piece of advertising for him. So what did he do? He made a sequel, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead Part 2. Then he also made another documentary about food for kids, the food the food uh, kids menu, which is all about how to help kids eat right. He's built an entire little empire on this one documentary. Another amazing story is Food Matters, is another food-based documentary where they, they, they there's been a lot of food-based documentaries that have come out, many of them, um, but... Food Matters, and another one called Forks Over Knives uh, that created little empires and businesses around their documentaries. Food Matters actually made a documentary years ago. They haven't made another one that I know of, but what they did is they, they sold books, recipe books, books, again, coaching services, but what they did is they actually created a streaming service. So they actually created kind of like their own Netflix but with exclusive documentaries and movies that they license from other filmmakers that are all in the wellness uh, arena, whether that be food and yoga and meditation and all sorts of stuff that people who are going after, the audience that's going after understanding more about where their food comes from and things like that would probably be interested in maybe meditation or maybe in uh, yoga or maybe into working out or other things. Do you see the business mind? What I'm trying to impress upon you is where the business mind has gone to. Uh, They also have courses that they sell on how to clean, how to eat properly and uh, cleansing and all sorts of things like that. It's mind-blowing that this little family of two, this little family, this this couple in Australia, both, by the way, Australian, um, that did this insane business plan. Now, another one, and and Fork Over Knives did the exact same thing. Fork Over Knives is probably a bigger documentary and made a lot more waves in the world in regards to what they were trying to do as far as eating more plant protein and all that kind of good stuff. And they have similar revenue streams from cooking books, books, apps, uh, as well as courses on how to take care of yourself, all sorts of stuff uh, as well. And another story about another doc that is not 
food-based specifically called Crazy Sexy Cancer. Now, you must be thinking, how in God's green earth can you build an empire about cancer? Well, Chris Carr has done just that. She was an actress who was diagnosed with cancer in her 20s, I think, and she and it was a stage four cancer that could not be treated. It was 100% mortality. So what she decided to do is change the way she did everything. She did the entire, kind of reversed her cancer and documented it by doing a uh, whole, play, whole food uh, plant-based diet as well as meditations and yogas and all sorts of other alternative ways of going about it. And she she did. She she beat cancer, a very strong cancer and rare cancer. And she was able to write multiple books uh, about like just supportive uh, information about people with, with cancer, how to juice, lecture series where she puts uh, you know nine hours of her lectures around the world, digital meditation albums, cookbooks, obviously, cleanses. She actually teaches a course on how to do a 21-day cleanse, all sorts of product lines while she's still being paid around the world to, to speak off of her documentary, off of her film. And she was not a filmmaker prior to that. She just grabbed the camera. And that film is from 2003. So she's been doing this for 15 years almost. And she's still going strong. So one documentary built her entire career. And a lot of these guys did that. One film essentially set them up for life with a lot of hustle and a lot of entrepreneurship. So revenue streams. I want to talk about those specifically and what things, ideas that you can do. And I kind of tossed a bunch of those ideas out already uh, explaining the, the case studies, but I'm just going to review them right now. Obviously, books. Uh, you can write a book about your the making of your movie. Uh, you can write a book about certain processes inside of your movie, whether that be like the example of the uh, the horror movie that teaches you how to actually become you know a horror expert and making fake horror you know makeup and blood of squirts and all that stuff. And don't forget, guys, a lot of this information is out there. A lot of the stuff I talk about is out there. Uh, if you do the research and want to spend days and days and days going out there looking and hunting, you can. But a lot of times you could package this all together and people will pay for it because it's convenient. They don't have the time to go out there and hunt for everything. That's why, you know, a lot of these books that you buy, a lot of that information is out there and it's been out there for years. But they package it in a new way, they add value to it and people buy it because it helps them in whatever they're trying to do in their lives. The next thing, obviously, swag, T-shirts, hats, stickers. Depending on the kind of movie you've got and the type of audience you have that you're trying to sell to, you could be very creative in this and become very, very popular. I mean, Range 15, they had a T-shirt business prior to this, so they were easily able to just pump out more content, and excuse me, not more content, but more product lines with Range 15, but their audience was already primed for it. A lot of these audiences are already primed for it. I mean, I'll go again back to the horror uh, the horror genre, uh, horror horror fans generally love T-shirts. They love cool graphic T-shirts. Why wouldn't you be making cool graphic T-shirts with either characters or just basic sayings or whatever? Create a business around it. Another thing could be streaming services. Uh, you can create a streaming service around your doc like Food Matters did or around your movies. Like if you're doing movies on, and again, I'll use this, I've used this example a million times, and I think I'm just going to have to make this movie, the Vegan Chef movie. Uh, imagine making a narrative Vegan Chef movie and creating, mo I could just count off 20 different revenue streams that you can make off of that narrative film and continue to do so forever. You can create streaming services just like Food Matters and move on and on. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, guys. There are blueprints out there. Go study everything that I'm talking about. Study these people. Study what they're doing. Use those blueprints in your own movies, in your own films, in your own projects, uh, and what you're trying to do, whether it be making a feature film, a documentary, or going to YouTube, or making a web series. Whatever it is, a lot of this, bl oh, these blueprints will work for you. You just have to figure out how it works with your audience. I mean, for God's sakes, I was in like Whole Foods the other day, uh, or in the supermarket the other day, and I saw Fork Over Knives uh, you know, frozen foods. It's a documentary. But because of their audience, they were able to now leverage that into making other product lines. So, guys, I've, I've, I've kind of spewed out so much information here, so many ideas. I just want to impress upon you that 
to make money as a filmmaker, you can't just think about one thing. You can't just think about, hey, I'm just going to make my movie self-distribute it, which is great, and also uh, maybe go out to a distributor, and that's the end of the world. It's not. If you're creative, you do your research, you understand who your audience is and how to get to that audience and how to market to that audience, you can make a business around your feature film, your short film, your documentary, your web series, or even your YouTube channel. I mean, look, I, I and I hate to bring this movie up because I'm tired of talking about it, but I use it as an example because it was a hell of a great example at the time. My little short film, Broken, that I did back in 2005, I understood who my, my audience was and I sold the product to my audience that they wanted to hear. That audience was filmmakers back in 2005 and I saw that there was a something missing in the marketplace. There was no DVDs on how to make an independent short or independent feature using just regular you know, Panasonic DVX-100A and Final Cut kind of products, that level, not the million dollar level, but the $5,000, $10,000 level. There was nothing back then. So I saw an opportunity and then I marketed the hell out of it to the point where people still ask me about it, still talk to me about it over 12 years later. And after that, I was able to sell almost $100,000 worth of DVDs. And I'm still making money off of that project. I'm still, I still make money all the time. I still sell DVDs every once in a while. I incorporated a lot of those elements in my, my online course, Filmmaking Hacks. Uh, I, did, I did all of that, and I'm still making revenue from it. It's remarkable. So there are blueprints. There are other people who've walked the path before you. Watch what they did. Learn from their mistakes and learn from their successes and kind of model what they do you know, and see how it affects your project and see what you can do to make money with your film because I want you guys to succeed. I want you guys to be able to make a living doing what you love to do. Now, I'm not saying that this is not going to be without work. It's You're going to have ball busting work, but you're going to be busting your balls for yourself. As the saying goes, if you don't follow your dreams, someone else will hire you to make their dreams come true. Now, to get links to Everything I talked about on this episode, which is fairly a lot, uh, go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 171, and I'll have all the links to all of these amazing stories in the show notes. And guys, also, when you get a chance, head over to my YouTube channel, which there's going to be some exciting stuff happening there in the coming weeks. So head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube. It'll take you directly to my YouTube page. Subscribe. And there's going to be a lot of exciting content coming to the YouTube page. I have a lot of stuff I'm working on. I'm going to be battle planning a bunch of stuff for the rest of the summer and the fall. I got a lot of cool stuff coming for you guys. So I really hope uh, hope you like what I have in store. So definitely check it out. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 